Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, we have, uh, today we're going to do another step in our testify series. And I have asked Angie if she would come and share her testimony, but we're going to wait for a moment so everybody gets back in here. Uh, I think it's important that everybody gets an opportunity to hear what God has done for each of us. Um, so uh, I want to extend a couple of thank yous today. Uh, yesterday, the wood pantry was in full swing. Um, how much wood would you say, how much wood would, how much wood would you say was actually delivered yesterday, Matthew? Um, I don't know, four or five cords. Four or five cords. I know there were seven trucks and two trailers, and we had everything from Dennis's truck that was beautifully stacked. You couldn't even breathe through it. Ah. And I was watching, and I, I'm, I'm sorry, Dustin, because I asked you to step up and help Dennis, and he kept making you take them off and restack them. <laughs> but I tell you what, Dennis got more wood in his truck than I think any other two trucks combined. <laughs> but we were able to help out three houses yesterday with wood. And so uh, we had seven trucks, two trailers. Uh, we had incredible people show up to help. So, Matthew, thank you for organizing that, for being a contact person, for bringing the wood in, getting it cut, getting it split, getting it stacked, getting it loaded and delivered. Um, I think this is an incredible blessing. Uh, something for us to be aware of also, a big thank you to Matthew. Thank you for all the people that showed up yesterday to help. Something for us to also be aware of, uh, winter's coming in. That means a lot of people aren't able to do the work that they would do in the warmer weather. Uh, the food pantry is being used again, so we're probably going to have to start working with keeping that stocked up. Um, so, something to be aware of. If you know of somebody that has a need, in the bulletin there's actually a flyer. It's two-sided. Look at both sides. Okay, because both of them are important. Both of them have to do with keeping warm. Uh, there is a coat drive going on in Hamilton. Um, if you have coats that are gently used, uh, they, they would really like them down there to bless families that can't afford coats to stay warm this winter. Uh, the flip side of that is the wood pantry. Uh, there's information in there. If you know of somebody, if you need help keeping your house warm this winter, or you know of somebody that needs help keeping your house warm this winter, please contact Matthew. That's the purpose of this, this wood pantry, this wood ministry. So uh, thank you specifically to Matthew for organizing that, heading it up and taking care of that. And also thank you for Sally for taking care of the food pantry. Okay, Angie, are you ready? All right, ready or not, here it goes. Everybody says this when they come up, but I am like really, really nervous. <laughs> okay, so um, so you guys finally got me up here to talk. Everybody's been asking me for the last 17 years to talk, so. <laughs> um, I have to start with a joke, though, to lighten things up, because I <laughs> tend to get you know, a little tense. Okay. So this lady goes to psychiatrist, right? And she, or psychologist or whatever, she goes and says, I keep having this dream that I am a wigwam and a teepee. And the counselor goes, well, I know your problem, you're too tense. <laughs> so, I Happy to be up here, um, believe it or not. I was like, you know, when, when, when Glenn skipped over me, where's Glenn? I'm hiding. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I was supposed to like do this earlier when the other leadership was up here, but um, I guess I, he thought I did it. And anyway, I guess today is the day that I'm supposed to do that. Um, the one thing that, it actually makes me excited to share my testimony because, um, and I realized that because um, a few months ago we went on a trip to Seattle and I had a chance to 
ride with a friend who's visiting um, and getting to know her, actually. Um, and one of the, the first things she asked me was like, I really want to get to know you. It's like, she goes, what? I want to know your testimony. And, and she goes, I want to tell you mine. And I was just like, um, that blew me away. I was just um, like, you want to know my testimony? And so we were like, um, I'm sorry, I'm all over the place, you guys. I'm just, my brain is swimming. Um, but it just amazed me that she wanted to hear my story. And I couldn't wait till we got an interstate and we could start talking about it. And um, it was just a real good time. And I realized how much I enjoy when everybody comes up here and shares, because I think it's important that we hear each other's stories and be encouraged <coughs> by them and, um, and just see what the Lord is doing in everybody's life. So. Um, So, um, everybody heard my parents' story um, of how we were in the accident when I was little, and, um, and I guess that um, starts things out because um, after that accident, none of us should have been here, and um, I just realized God's um, hand in our life and how as a baby um, you know, thrown out of the car I shouldn't even be here but yet God knows um, our, our days and our times and um, so that wasn't my time yet and, nor my family and my family God used that to, to bring my parents to a knowledge of him mm -hmm. and um and through their faith, um, I had opportunity to see that in action and, um, and learn at a, at a young age, uh, you know, what, it, what meant to know him and come to know him. And, um, you know, my parents gave us a lot of opportunities, Sunday school and um, good news clubs and, uh, Uh, those really had an influence on me and, and the stories that were taught. And I remember my teachers praying for us, and I couldn't understand um, why my Sunday school teacher was praying so intently for us. And and my um, my friend and I would kind of like we joke about it. It's like because I mean, she'd really be into it. She'd be like out loud, like you know. You know how how we sometimes say yes, Lord, and we whisper and we pray, and they're just. I just remember that. I remember people praying for me, and and I know that that had a huge um, impact, and, and those people cared, and and um, so never stop praying. And never, you know, if you think the job is small, um, that you're. Uh, you know, God puts people there for a reason to pray for. And, um, so, okay. Um, the Holy Spirit got hold of me when I was really little, um, convicting me of what sin is and my separation from God. And, um, like, I have some stories that I, I remember, and... They kind of seem small. It's like, well, that's what kids do. But um, but they had a huge impact on me. And one of them was like when I was, I don't know, maybe three or four. Um, and my mom said, Angie, no cookies before dinner. And I, my mom had just made these really great cookies, you know, colorful <laughs> cookies. They're like, so sugar cookies with really, you know, you can't not eat them and um, said no I asked for cooking she said no we're gonna eat soon but I remember specifically climbing on the cupboard going out of my way to get the step stool 
go up on the cupboard. I remember the exact colors of the cookies. I, I remember the, they looked like they were brown, orange, blue, green, and what the frosting looked like on them. And I knew it was wrong, and I felt guilt. I felt my conscience. I felt, um, you know, I, to a point where I hid behind a chair to eat them. <laughs> I a Spanish print, green and yellow chairs from the seventies. And I remember sitting behind there. I had the print memorized. I just feeling guilt, like I just disobeyed. And I purposely went out of my way to disobey. And um, you know, just just realizing, you know, now that was the Holy Spirit working in my life and convicting me. And another story was just um, I I was pretty young and I used to wear cowboy boots when I was little. It was like I don't know, the tomboy kind of kid. Is I was jealous of my sister, and I kicked her in the face with my cowboy boots. <laughs> and uh, you know, another story where I um, went to the store, and there were, you know, like you have things up front you buy. There were chiclet gums, and they fell on the floor. And and I thought, well, if they fell on the floor, I can take them. <laughs> Nobody wants them. They're not up in the thing where you can buy them. So I, I crawled on the floor and I picked them up and I took them home. And immediately I felt guilty and felt my conscience and um, tried to stuff them down in the seat in the old Mercury to try to hide them. And um, got home and I couldn't even enjoy them. I mean, it's like, I can't. I, I just threw them away. Because, you know, the Holy Spirit was working, and, um, anyway, and one last thing I was going to share, and maybe I, Glenn, forgive me, but, um, when, when I was little, you know, I, I, I wasn't an angel, I was up in the balcony of the old church we were at, and we had these little purses, and they had little beads all over them, I'd pick the beads off, and we throw them <laughs> We throw them below basketball the bald guys. separated from him, you know, even things like that, and um, so he got a hold of me, you know, when I was, I think I was like five years old, and he was convicting me, we used to have altar calls at, at the church I went to, and um, he would keep convicting me, like, you know what you need to do, you know, you need to go to the front, you need to become his, you need to know you're, you're forgiven, you need to know that um, you need to be safe, okay? So he's like, it's like he's speaking to me like this heavy thing, like tapping me on the shoulder each week. And I was like in the back and it's like me, I don't, you guys know me, I don't like drawing attention to myself. I don't like, you know, I can do that every Sunday because I'm looking at music and you guys are looking up there. <laughs> and you're, I, I can do that, but you know, right now everybody's looking at me and my brain is spinning all over the place. I, it, I don't like this. I don't, I don't like, you know, everybody's starting me. So it was hard to, to go up front, and, but I know that's something that he wanted me to do publicly. And um, so one Sunday I cheated and I sat in the front row <laughs> so I didn't have to walk in front of everybody. And, but I remember bowing down and just thanking the Lord for uh, saving me and forgiving me. And uh, So, you know, you're a kid and you you grow up. And when I was about nine, our church uh, was doing the uh, 
the movies about the end times or like uh, the old Thief in the Night and Distant Thunder movies and, and all those. And some of you know what I'm talking about, but um, they're, they're about the end times and um, tribulation period and all that. And, um, you know, I, there are things about those movies that I know, you know, aren't totally accurate or whatever, but there were a lot of things that really made me think, and um, they made me realize how much I don't want to be without God, how much I want to make sure I'm His, and um, just how scary it is just to not know Him, and what a bad place it is to not know Him. And so I, I was just, I just had this fear, you know, because I was so young when I came to the Lord, and I had a fear that. Um, you know, like, was I really kissed? Did I really make a decision? And so I remember um, with my mom one night uh, going to her and telling her, you know, you know, I really want to make sure this is right. I want to make sure I know the Lord. And so she prayed with me, and uh, and then I accepted the Lord again just to make sure I understood, you know, what I was doing. And um, so anyway, you know, through the years, my parents always provided um, opportunities for us to, to go to church, to learn about God, to, um, to, to, to learn about what the Bible had to say about things and, and to just get grounded and get a good foundation. And, um, but when my teen years came, things got, things got really difficult at home. I mean, I mean, it's amazing how things can, can step in and, and just cause emotions to come out of nowhere. And um, yeah, it, it's not something I really want to talk about, but it's, it's part of who I am and who, you know, where God brought me from. But just a, a lot of hard things going on with everybody, you know, emotionally and sometimes scary things, sometimes. Uh, depressing things, sometimes just a lot of uh, guilt and shame and, and different things. And, um, you know, you're going through that, you're a teenager and you're, you know, you're young and you're, you know, developing in a lot of different ways. And, and I also had hearing issues and other issues that I dealt with and, you know, it was hard for me to connect with people and, um, you know, on top of that, I, uh, you know, we moved in my in my high school years, and I lost all my friends and everything that was like um, everything I knew, you know, and it just you know, it's just a time where you feel alone and um, kind of rejected by people and kind of even made fun of by people and, and you know, so that was just a time where I kind of just really. Um, it was just hard to to let out emotions. It was hard to talk. It was hard. To, they're so deep, you know, that you, you just can't talk about them. And um, so I spent a lot of time um, with my piano and writing music. And um, spent a lot of time drawing. I spent a lot of time journaling and also um, the Lord, it was a time when I was drawn to the Lord where I really had to put my trust in Him and my friendship in Him, um, that He loved me and He understood me and knew what I was going through. And um, uh, so it was just a time of really growing in Him and knowing He loved me. and. Um, you know, even though it was really hard and deep, you know. Um, so, um, by the time I started college, God had done a lot of healing in my life and, and in my family and with all the things we were all dealing with. And um, I began to have a real burden for... Um, the people I went to college with, and I was an art major, and I went, um, 
spent a lot of time at, at the Colorado State University Art Department. And, you know, university is weird enough. <laughs> um, but if you go to the art department, <laughs> and, wow, um, there are some really intense things going on there. And, <laughs> weirdness and <laughs> sin and I mean you just every everything you know and um, but the Lord really gave me a burden for the people there and um, and I was able to you know interact with some and, and even one who was in the new age you know was able to show the gospel with her and she actually responded and that was Amazing to me because no one had ever really responded like that before and said, "Hey, I accepted the Lord," you know, kind of like told me. And um, so, um, anyway, I did have to watch. Though I kind of got myself in trouble because I thought to minister to people, you have to understand them, you have to know what they believe, you have to. So I was starting to like <clears throat> kind of, you know learn about some things that I shouldn't as a believer, you know, like, um, and, you know, because I thought, well, that's how I minister to them, that's how I get to know them, that's how I reach out to them, and, and the Lord convicted me of that, you know, it's like, you don't have to go to those places to understand them, to reach out to them, and, um, and, uh, so he convicted me of that, and, and kind of got me out of the place before I got kind of too deep into some things. Um, but, uh, you know, those same years, I was still kind of getting out of the, where things were so deep that it's hard to express things kind of mode. And um, God was also working on me because I, I was writing songs, I was playing the piano, and I was singing. But I was, I guess, she, I don't know, Rebellion might be the word. Um, but kind of in a place where it's like God saying, you know, um, stop locking the doors and closing the windows and waiting until everybody's gone and out of here before you sing in front of anybody. Um, I did not want to do that because it's like, if I start singing in front of people, what's God going to ask me to do? You know, it's like, if I start letting people know, you know, that I can do this, um, What's God going to ask me to do? And I, you know, God, I don't like being up in front of people. I don't like, um, you know, being vulnerable in front of people. Um, but anyway, I was miserable until I said yes. You know, it's like if I had kept pushing them off and hiding, so I was miserable. And, um, but anyway, I was ready, and I said, yeah, God, I give this to you. And, uh, so yeah, God opened up opportunities as soon as I gave that to him, and he uh, led me to church where, uh, originally I was just gonna go share a song with them. A friend of mine said, you know, you're writing those songs, and, um, and you should share those with the worship team at, at this church we're going to. And so my intention was, okay, I'm just gonna go and share this, this song with them. And so they listened, and then all of a sudden they go, well, they're trying to play it, and they go, well, why don't you sit down and play it? Because you're the one who wrote it. And so they go, okay, I'll, I'll do that. So I go there, and they said, well, you know, we're having a special service, and we'd like to do this song for special. And so um, would you mind playing this and singing this? And we'll sing with you, you know? And um, so I'm going, Oh, okay, so before I know it, there's this whole process of, before I know it, I'm on the worship team, playing my violin in front of people for a whole service, and it's like, I've never done this before, and it's like, but they wanted to work with me, and they, I don't know, it was just like, okay, so, it, it just reminded me once I let God have that, it's like he totally opened the doors, and it's like, like, how did I even get from here to here, you know, in that amount of time? And, um, so that's where I learned, you know, what, what I do, I guess, here. 
I, without that foundation and people willing to be work, being willing to work with me, I wouldn't have uh, been able to do that. And um, and I didn't know how much of this to get into, but that place was a real blessing to me because of the music, and um, it kind of hit one of the passions in my heart, which was I realized how much I love learning about Jesus in the whole of the scripture, not just, it was a place where um, we're learning Old and New Testament and, and history and just the richness of God's word as a whole. And I just love that. I, I had a passion for that and I had a passion for all the prophecies that are in the scriptures and just seeing how God fulfilled all those and um, so that was, God really used that place um, in my life for a season, um, but you know, things got kind of messed up there and we had to go from there and I didn't want to, but um, you know, God was just saying it's time to move on because people had forgotten their first love and, um, and there was a lot, of, a lot of issues and error that was going on and it, it's like, the Lord showed me, you know, you can't stay because you're afraid to lose those friendships or you're afraid um, that God's going to stop doing something with the music. You can't stay for that reason. And um, so we moved us on. By that time, Steve and I were married. And um, we just felt led. It was, it was a real hard time. It was a confusing time, but we moved on. And um, I don't know. Um, so now, you know, we moved up here in 1998 and started going here and um, been here ever since. And, um, but honestly, you know, just feeling for a long time, just feeling really complacent and really um, like, feel like a sitting on the bleachers watching everybody else do kind of person. and. Um, you know, God has been showing me that, uh, you know, he wants me to start, he wants me to be more active, and, and that's another area where I, like, want to fight God, because it's like, I, I don't feel equipped, I, I don't, <laughs> I've been a believer for 39 years, and it's like, I don't feel equipped, you know, Lord, I don't feel good enough, I don't feel like I can relate to people, uh, so, but he says, no, I equip you. I give you my, my spirit to do it. And you don't have to do it in your strength, in your personality and everything else that, that you feel so weak in and like you fall short in. And so that's something I'm learning. It's like it's God's strength that's God in us. And uh, so, uh, anyway, I want to just leave with a few verses because I feel like my whole life the Holy Spirit has has been working in my life and you know, showing me and I, I get, it's like I'm thankful that I listened to him. You know, it's like, it's like all the times in my life, like when I, like what if I had listened or, or I think about the time when, times when I don't listen, it's like, what it could have been if I would have listened, you know, and what he saved me from when I did listen, what he, how he blessed me when I did listen. And uh, so these two verses, uh, Hebrews 4, 7 says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. And Revelation um, 3, 19 and 20, um, the Lord says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Um, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and be with me. And so I just wanted to leave you guys with that. And um, I, I hope... The two tenths didn't get the best of me today. <laughs> but, um, 
But I'd like to share my testimony with you guys. And, and I do, I, I look forward to hearing everybody who comes up here and, and shares. So, thank you. actually came to me and asked about sharing her testimony and I was mortified because I know I've read my list and I know Angie gave her testimony and I know I'm dead wrong <laughs> and when she said that I'm, I'm scrambling I'm thinking I know I know what I don't know and I don't know what I know and and uh, I said okay how about Sunday and she said oh <laughs> Let me think about this. Thank you very much, Angie. Um, God is so faithful to us, and he's so gracious to us. I, I love what Angie said about what happened when she didn't listen to him, but also what happened when she did. Because, wow, his plans for us are good plans. And I, I'm going to share something, and I don't mean to embarrass you or put you on the spot, but God has done something in Angie over the last three or four months. And I think, honestly, today, it was her, her sharing that God had been asking her to do things and I think what happened was several months ago, Christy and I were seeing her being resistant and saying no. We, we had no idea what it was, but we could just tell that she was struggling. And we were praying for her and praying for her and not knowing what we were praying for. But God has done something over especially the last two months where she just radiates joy and peace. She's telling jokes. <laughs> and, and just seems to have something that just kind of exudes out from her. And so it, it's been a blessing to, to watch that, Angie. Thank you for sharing that. Um, today we are talking, we're, we're still in the fruit of the Spirit, so Galatians chapter 5, go ahead and turn there, if you would, please. going to start reading in verse 16, Galatians chapter 5, and we're going to start in verse 16. Paul's writing, he says, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And Paul lists, not in, in uh, full detail, but he lists some of the works of the flesh. And, and I, I want to stress that because if you have sin in your life and it doesn't fall in this list, you're not excused. You're not okay. Okay, just because it didn't make this list does not mean it's okay. So he, he goes through a list, and I'm going to pick up down in verse 22. Because we're not talking about the works of the flesh. The idea, I mean, you, you look around and you see the works of the flesh, and, and that's one of the things that stood out to me when Angie was talking. Several times she said, oh, that's what kids do. And I'm very mindful of how easily we excuse sin. Oh, that's just what kids do. Oh, that's just what teens do. Oh, that's just what men do. Oh, that's just what women do. And, and it's almost like 
we excuse our nature because of our nature. Oh, that's just what sinners do. Yeah. That's the point. If, if you really are not firmly convinced of the sin nature, look at children. Mom, can I do this? Go ask your father. <laughs> Dad, Mom said I could do this. She did? Yes. Well, huh. Let me talk to your mom. Oh, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> or, did you ask your father? Okay, well, go ahead. Why are you letting that child do that? Well, they said they asked you. Yeah, and I told them no. Well, they didn't tell me that part. <laughs> Look at the nature of children. What is their favorite word? No! Followed immediately by their second favorite word. Mine! mine. <laughs> that is not yours. That is mine. Put that down. Give me that. Put that away. Bill Cosby does that so wonderfully. <laughs> just let the child have it. Because parents just want quiet. Okay? But children just show us the nature of sin. And we write it off. We excuse it. Oh, that's just, that's just don't think so cute. Punt. <laughs> No, that's not cute. That's evidence of our desperate need from birth of a Savior. They're so innocent. There's nothing innocent about them. <laughs> they are self-centered. They believe the world revolves around them. Why do they do? Why do they believe that? Because we encourage that. They cry, we feed them. They cry, we burped in. <laughs> Would you burp him? <laughs> you just keep him there for a while. They get poopies and we change them. Every need, even when it stops becoming a need, every want is immediately gratified. And then we have a culture, thank you, Dr. Spock, that tells us that correcting that type of behavior is inappropriate. We need to let them be free to be themselves. Themselves are turds. <laughs> I have said that about my children. I probably said it about your children. <laughs> Dave and Shelley, I know I said it about Dustin. I told him to his face, Dustin, you're a turd. That was Last night. But the idea behind this is that the nature is so evident from birth. And then they, they grow up and the nature just becomes more evident. And, and you know, we, we can't just write it off. That should make us so much more aware of our need for a Savior. Of how very far we are removed from God. <clears throat> and that should just make us all that much more aware of how great what He's done for us is. That He's made a way for us to be restored in spite of all of that. So we come to salvation, and we receive His Spirit. We're sealed, stamped. We have His Spirit in us, the seal of our salvation. Okay? But when His Spirit is in us, and we are sealed with His Spirit, there's certain things that have to take place. There's certain things that have to happen. We have to start looking different. We have to stop looking like the wild root 
the weed, and we have to start looking like fruit-bearing plants. We got to get rid of the thorns and the thistles, and we got to start producing fruit in keeping with His Spirit. And you go, uh oh, we have to do something. Well, yeah, we do. We have to let Him do it in us. Now, I need to clarify something. First, whose fruit is this? It's the Holy Spirit's fruit. But do you understand that you can prevent that fruit from going and you can also encourage that fruit to grow? Do you understand? You are an active participant in this. You can't just wake up and go, Oh, today I'm going to exhibit peace. Wait till you get on the road. Peace is gone. Wait till you walk out and your coffee machine is broken. Well, some of you, there went all the fruit right out the window. Because as soon as you endeavor to work on one of these fruits, God is going to put you in a place where you have to have it. And I told you last week, I don't know who of you were praying for this week's message, but quit! <laughs> Now, I told you last week we were going to be talking about peace. And man, Monday was okay, Tuesday was okay, Wednesday went pfft, right downhill. And I had to work to live in the peace that he's given me. I had to work at it because things were chaotic and in turmoil around me. And, and you, you can ask my family. I went like this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Pfft, yeah, 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 yeah pfft. <laughs> now, that's actually a good thing because it used to would have been <clears throat> okay, that's how it would have been but the fact that he was enabling me and, and, and allowing me to climb back up I have to work on that Okay, so one, it's God's fruit but you are responsible to allow that fruit to grow in your life Okay, So don't just think, I'm going to kick back in my lazy boy and in a couple hours I'm going to get up and I'm going to be full of the fruit of his spirit. That's not discipline. Okay, So we have to allow God's spirit to work in us. Don't work against his spirit. Man, if he's working, I, I'm not looking forward to patience. Man, when we have to talk about patience... Pray for me, not against me. Okay? Because every week God is taking me through. I told Christy after this series, man, I'm going to preach on the blessings of God. <laughs> because every time I have to preach a message, he takes me through it and makes me have to deal with it. And I realize sometimes how very far removed I am because I thought, man, hey, peace. God's been dealing with peace. I, I got a grasp on that one. No. <laughs> This week, God reminded me how far removed I am and how much more I have to grow. Okay? So we're going to talk about peace. Back here, I'm going to read through this real quick. It says, uh, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. So we talked about love and joy. And this week we're going to talk about peace. Now, I like to understand what I'm talking about. <clears throat> Sometimes. Sometimes I just like to talk about it. We all do. You're there with me. Uh, but the dictionary defines peace as a state of tranquility or quiet. If you've ever been in my house, you know that does not exist in my house. Tranquility and quiet. Freedom from disquieting or oppressive thoughts. If you've ever been in my brain, you know that doesn't exist. <laughs> Harmony in personal relations. Enough said. <laughs> A state or period of mutual concord between governments. Here's the problem. 
God tells us that he wants us to have a peace that the world cannot understand. Okay, they, they don't get it. And he further tells us that they can't give it. Okay, so if the world doesn't understand it, and the world can't give it, why would we think that this definition would in any way apply to us? The world doesn't understand. So they're trying to define something they don't understand. Physics. I'm not going to give you a definition of physics because I don't understand it. Quiche. I'm not going to give you a definition because I don't understand it. Okay? That's just something I don't get. If God has a peace for us that the world doesn't have and the world doesn't understand and the world can't give us what does that piece look like? Well, let's take a look. And I didn't write it down. So I'm going to tell it to you and you can look it up later. It's actually in each of the Gospels. And Jesus is speaking to the crowd. And... The night comes on, and, and he tells the disciples, he said, I'm, I'm going to go pray. And he goes up to pray. And the disciples get in a boat, and in, in some of the Gospels, Jesus tells them, go to the other side of the lake. Get in the boat, go to the other side of the lake, and off they go. And Jesus is watching them. He's sitting up on a hillside or on the side of a mountain, and he's watching them. And a storm comes up, and it blows against them. And I'm telling you the wrong story. <laughs> Sorry, this is not, that's not it. We're going to back up. Jesus is actually in the boat. Okay. This is peace. This is peace. The storm rages up. Now, i, I got to ask you guys. Why did they keep going out on the sea? Every time they go out on the sea, something bad happens. The storm rages up. There's no fish. There's too many fish. A storm rages up. So the storm is blowing, and it's blowing, and it's hard. And it's back and forth. And the disciples, now keep in mind, of the disciples, at least four of them were fishermen. They were used to boats. But the scripture tells us that they were despairing of their lives. They're worried. They're thinking, we're going to die. Where was Jesus? He's in the back of the boat, asleep on a pillow. The scripture is very clear about that. He was asleep on a pillow. Now, the storm is raging. And you have people that are used to storms on the sea. Now, I've done a little bit of research about the Sea of Galilee. Storms come up very suddenly, and they're bad. And when a storm comes up, the best thing for them to do is get to shore. Okay? So it, this isn't like, you know, something down at Como. This is, this is something that they're despairing of their lives. Water's coming in the boat. Levi, bail it. With what? We're going down, guys. All, everything, it, we're, we're despairing of life. And they go to Jesus, and they wake him up. Jesus! I don't understand it. I mean, have you ever been in the midst of a storm of that magnitude? I've been in some pretty big storms. They're not quiet. They're loud. There's noise. And he's sleeping. Wake up! Don't you know what's going on? And Jesus gets up. And he rebukes the wind and the waves. And he says, be still. Still. Now, I, I don't know how you get. I read emotion into scripture. Okay? And he looks at the disciples, and I think Jesus is kind of frustrated with them. He says, Well, you, you have little faith. What is wrong with you? He's not mad at the weather. He's frustrated with them. What is wrong with you? Do you still have so little faith? 
And they're going. He just he calmed the storm. Who is this we're still going to follow him? He's calming the storm. Peter's just like, I don't know. If he can do that, he can probably let me walk across water. You never know what he can do. That's the other story. <laughs> See, peace is not that there's nothing going on around you. Peace is not even that there's not anything going on inside of you. Peace is knowing the one that is taking you through. Knowing the one that can calm the storm. Knowing that he's not going to let you sink. That he's not going to let you go. That he's got you. And he's taking you through. Okay? That's the peace we're looking for. I don't want just nothing to happen in my life. Because honestly, according to what I read in Scripture, if nothing happens in my life, I'm absolutely of no use to him. My faith is weak and puny and pale. Trials come that we may test and refine our faith. That we can see how much worth they are. Okay? So without the trials, we don't really understand what peace is. Okay? So the peace that we're looking for is the peace that he gives in the midst of the storm. So we're going to look at a couple of scriptures here real quick. Isaiah 26. Don't, don't turn there. You guys, I can give you the references later. You can look them up later. Isaiah 26 says, You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. So, how do we get this peace? How do we work toward this peace? Now, we understand that it's God's peace living inside of us, but there are certain things that we do to encourage that to grow. Now, I know we have gardeners in here. I know we have some incredible gardeners in here. Do you just throw the seed out and let it go? Hope for the best? Well, that's what I do. <laughs> My green thumb is more brownish. What do you do? How do you encourage the seed to grow? Water. What else? We got to put, you know, some of that fertilizer, healthy growth stuff on there. You got to go in and make sure the weeds are not choking it out. You work the soil. Depending what you're growing, you might have to prune some things back. But it takes work to make it work. And see, with peace, there are certain things that we can do to encourage its growth. The biggest thing is getting out of the way. Okay? And we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. But right here, did you notice what this said at the start? You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Now, you know that the second definition says freedom from disquieting or oppressive thoughts. We all have thoughts, and I, I get so sick of thinking, oh, you can't control what you think about. Lie, that's a lie. You may not be able to control what comes in your mind in a moment, but you can control whether or not you're going to dwell on it, whether or not you're going to play with it, whether or not you're going to invite it in for key. Okay? We've talked about this. I am firmly convinced that Scripture tells us to control our thoughts. We set our thoughts on things above. We are transformed by the renewing of our minds. Okay? So, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. <laughs> Why do we trust him? Because he's an everlasting rock. He's not going to change. He is always faithful. So focus on him instead of your problems. We, we've all got problems. We've all got stuff that happens. 
oftentimes we have multiple problems all coming at one time. And if that's what you're dwelling on and that's where your thoughts are, you're going to struggle. You're going to fail. Put your minds on Him. What else can we do? Well, John 16, 33 says, In this world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. He's overcome the world. Matter of fact, the verse before that, he tells them, I'm telling you these things. What things is he telling them? He's telling them about the bad things that are going to come on them. Hey, guys, you want to follow me? Guess what? It's going to stink. The world's going to hate you because they hate me. Then you're going to suffer persecution. You're going to suffer hardship. You might suffer hunger. Follow you. Why? Why would we want this? If he left it right there, all 12 of them would have been gone. But he doesn't stop there. He says, uh, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Okay? Take heart. He doesn't say you're not going to go through tribulation. That's one of the things that drives me nuts about a lot of the preachers today. Come to Jesus and all your problems are solved. It's going to be great. A man, that's not what his word tells us. You look at what he told the disciples and what he said was coming. He didn't tell us it wasn't going to be hard. He said it was going to be worth it. He said he was going to take us through it. He was going to be there with us. Be there with us. So trust that what he has said he will do, he will do. Trust that what he said he's done, he has done. He has already overcome the world. Ephesians 2 says that for he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross thereby killing the hostility. You get what's going on here? Conflict, conflict, conflict. Jesus comes in, he goes to the cross, he reconciles the need for that conflict, making us one with him. We are united before God, and he gives us peace. Now, interesting, did you catch the last definition that I gave you? I said, uh, state or period of mutual concord between governments. Do you know what he's saying here? He's saying here that the enemy is defeated and there's no longer a need for war because he's already won it. Now, let's, let's look at this and turn it around the other way because see, what he's saying right here is without him, you are at war with God. You are his enemy. You are in opposition to the sovereign creator of the universe and everything in it. You're resisting him. You set yourself in opposition to him. But through the cross, Jesus has not only overcome our enemy, but he has reconciled us to God. Now, now get this straight in your mind. Okay? Before the cross... You don't have a friend in the devil. He's not your buddy. He's still your enemy. His goal is still to annihilate you. He doesn't like you. He never likes you. He wants your utter destruction. He wants your life to be one of despair. But before the cross, you've also set yourself against God. You just made everybody mad. But the cross, ah, there, you're reconciled to God in all of eternity. 
Now, the enemy didn't like you before. He hates you right now. Because when you come to the cross, he sees that he can no longer exert any control or authority over you except what God will allow. He will say, you can come this further, and that's it. You cannot cross this line. Because I, I'm going to take him to this point. And you know what's going to happen? When he takes you to that point, and he builds you up, and he strengthens you, and he increases your faith, guess what happens? The line moves. Why? Because the whole purpose of this is to be made holy. He has forever made perfect those who are being made holy. Now don't get me wrong. We are holy before God right now. Why? Because of something we've done? No, it's because of the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus was perfect. And he has given us that blessing. We are holy before God because of what he has done. But he is working that ick out of us. All that, that stuff we were talking about, the sin nature, the, the, the conditions, the, the ruts that we've set for ourselves, he's working those out of us. So he's reconciled. He has brought peace. For he himself is our peace. We're going to stop here. Next week we're going to hit part two. Actually, no, next week we will not. Next week we're going to go to one of the fruits of the Spirit that I don't believe is, is really in this list. You go, wait, you can't do that. Yes, I can. As I told you, this was not an all-inclusive list. This is kind of a, a cliff's notes of the fruit that comes of a life led by his spirit. There are other things that are going to be, Scripture tells us very clearly, earmark those that belong to God. Okay? And we're going we're gonna to hit on one of those next week. So we're going to take a little deviation, and then we're going to come right back to peace. Okay? You guys okay with that? Yes. Well, good, because that's where we're going. <laughs> Have peace. Father, we bless you today. I thank you, Father, for your, your spirit, Father, that you just, you have not left us alone. But you have sent your spirit to us, Father, to teach us, to guide us, to grow us. I thank you, Father, for testimony. Father, your word says that they overcome with their testimony. It's one of the components that is needed, Father. I thank you that we all have a testimony to your goodness to us to your greatness and what you've done on our behalf. I ask, Father, that you would help us to be settled in our hearts and our minds, that this fruit is something that you have given us, and, Father, it's not something we can attain on our own, but, Father, we can do things to help it grow, to nurture it, to let it be more abundant in our lives. I ask, Father, that you would help us to walk by the Spirit we would not gratify the flesh, Father. Help us to be a people in whom you are well pleased. We bless you today, Father, and we thank you for all of these abundant blessings that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.